Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make better decisions and more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. Today is a totally Toro episode with four PIs. My four PIs. Here we go. Season 2, Episode 8 of the Copy Traders Club podcast, and as always, my aim as an eToro enthusiast and copy trader is to demystify this new and uncharted world of copy trading, understand what are the pitfalls and best practices, and how ultimately to succeed as a copy trader. This episode is a five-person recording, and with so many participants, you multiply the chances of technical problems. And indeed, poor audio due to participants' equipment and settings, and so on. So apologies for the occasional funkiness in audio. That apology, of course, is strictly limited to listeners who support the show via Patreon. If more listeners, like you, did support the show, I could, of course, upgrade the software and so on to improve such matters. So I will leave that thought with you. Today, I enjoy what must be every copy trader's wet dream, getting all their PIs together in a room to give them some grief. So, am I mourning my copies are red, or am I on the cusp of glory? Let's see what our popular investors have to say as we welcome Karan Mohan, a.k.a. Samosa King. Hi, Karan. How are you doing? Hey, Gavin. Thanks for having me on. Our first ever guest on Copy Traders Club, a little over a year ago. And so welcome back for your second appearance, Karan. Thank you. Next up, we have Robert Reynolds, a.k.a. Robert Merck. How are you, Rob? Doing great, Gav. Doing great. Back for a record equaling third Copy Traders Club appearance. Yes, sir. Also joining us, Marco Willikins, a.k.a. Elite Vol. Hi, Marco. Hi, Gavin. Nice to be back. Marco also joins that select band of elites, appropriately, given his username on three episodes of the podcast. And completing our four horsemen of the apocalypse, we have Wesley, a.k.a. Wes L3Y. How's it, Wes? How's it, bud? How's it going? Wes, of course, first appeared in October last year and is back with us for a second time. So here we all are. Do any of you guys know each other at all? Well... Wes was very kind enough to reach out to me in the earlier days. Thank you very much, Wes. It gave me a lot, an awful lot more of a confidence booster to get my my act together. So I, I've I've had conversations with Wes in the past, and first time meeting Marco and, and Karan. Yeah, everyone else is new to each other's presence. Yes, yes. Uh, I have seen Wesley occasionally uh, on on some of the meetings of the PIs uh, back when I just. Uh, was that a just choice? But besides that, no, Robert, Karan, I've not met before. I've kept up with Robert and Wes's uh, videos, but apart from that, yeah, not much. Always learn something new. So yeah, good videos, good content. Well, it's exciting for me to be putting the band together. <laughs> okay, so we've got three main subjects to tackle today. Part one, I get to ask each of you, what the hell are you doing with my money? Part two, how best to manage copier comments. And part three, like that smash button. We consider YouTube as a PI tool and the state of financial YouTube generally. Okay, so part one, what the hell are you doing with my money? And I'd like to address each of you, Re, my biggest concern in copying you. So that should be fun. This is the reason we got us all together, isn't it? Like the bash on us. (laughs) Well, it's certainly one of, one of the chief reasons, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Karan, for that interjection, you're up first. Yeah, I asked for it, literally. <laughs> so you're the guy who brought me to eToro, and I, of course, assumed that meant easy investing returns with none of the work. And it all started so well back in early 2021, but the fun and games stopped with GameStop. And now most of your hyper-concentrated portfolio is in pretty deep red. 
mostly the two biggest positions, which are due to China stocks being out of favor, Baba and Process. True. A proxy for Tencent. Two positions that I notice Wesley also has in smaller amounts. So, Karan, give me some reasons for hope. Some reasons for hope. I mean, again, I think like before the call, Wes was mentioning that he's reading Peter Lynch and in investing, it's the stomach that's the most important organ, right? If you can stomach the volatility, it doesn't matter how lumpy the returns are. Eventually, the goal, at least for most people, especially with continuity portfolios, is to get a good risk-adjusted return. And risk might not be how it's measured on the platform itself. Risk might mean different things to each of us as investors. But I think that my portfolio offers a good or satisfactory risk-adjusted return, and that's why I continue to invest the way that I do. So investing is a very personal thing, and with each PI, not only do you get their portfolio, but you also get the personality of the person. So it's worked out for me in the past, the way I've invested, and that's largely how I allocate my money. Like if I had no copiers, if I wasn't managing money for anyone else, this is pretty much exactly how I'd be managing money. And concentration, I feel like, is the way to go when managing portfolio. So you do get larger ups and downs with that. But I feel like if you can stomach the volatility, it's well worth the result because you get the best risk reward in that scenario. Well, everyone who knows me knows I have a considerable stomach. So I'll stick with that. Did you think of adding any money at all to buy more of these high conviction plays at lower prices? You know, so since the beginning, like whatever amount I have in there, that's pretty much the amount I'm going to stick to. And the reason why I started the eToro uh, account was kind of set up a track record, the fixed pool of capital that I can't add any money to. And let's see how much I can grow that. So no, I haven't added any money and don't intend on. Robert, wearer of the captain's armband, the Roy Keane of my PI team. (sighs) You're holding up relatively well. Oh, I should point out that I made these notes a few days ago before there was a big jump in many things. So they might sound slightly more negative than the specific situation we're in today. But with the way the market's going, who knows, we could be back there in a couple of days. The last month or two, I see you freed up some cash, closing the likes of Royal Mail, Vale, and Lockheed Martin. Thank goodness. One of the only blots on your copybook, in my opinion. You've been nibbling away at some positions to bring your average cost basis down. Overstock, Zillow, Nokia, Corsair, Palantir. And adding some new positions, Digital Turbine, Facebook, Crocs, and PayPal. And your message, which I know because of your frequent YouTube videos, is, yes, it's a turbulent time, but you believe you've made some really good acquisitions recently. Generally, the portfolio is in good shape. And you expect it to re-emerge from the red swamp as the market realizes that we're not in a recession and there are some bullish months ahead. Yes, sir. Where would you like like me to start? I mean, it's volatile. And and I know some of you guys may may believe that volatility is not a measure of risk, but I certainly do if there's a, a negative economic backdrop. But as of right now, we've actually got a very strong economy, very strong consumer. And volatility is offering up opportunities in a very sort of low liquidity market to buy undervalued companies. But if I had a crystal ball, I'd be able to figure out where that volatility would die out. But I I don't have that crystal ball, but I can measure the expected returns from good quality companies and the price that I'm willing to pay for them. So in the near term, if there's heightened volatility, do I see it as risk in this circumstance? No, because we've diversified an awful lot of that risk away across different sectors and industries. And I think it's just a matter of uh, buying into good quality, stable businesses that have a good chance of compounding long term, a very attractive prices. And then at the end of the day, it's just about being patient. And as uh, Karan mentioned, I mean, it, the stomach's the, the most important organ. After you do all that hard work, it's sitting through that volatility and being patient. And over the past week, we've gone from Monday down 13% in a portfolio to 
back flat today. So it's been it's been, <laughs> it's been a wild ride. And if I go back to January, it was in January where I started making those decisions to swap out defensive plays and go into a little bit higher beta, bring in the beta of the portfolio from one up to 1.47. And we're actually 102% leverage. We've got a slight bit of leverage in there as well. And the reason being is because the economic backdrop was very strong. We had uh, some very favorable companies that we could have bought into. Unfortunately, obviously, with what happened in Russia and Ukraine, you had a situation where Crude oil goes from $90 up to $130, space of two weeks. Everybody's concerned about inflation, and we're 100% in opposition for that. But all the data was suggesting that inflation would start to moderate. And even on the latest PPI report, we've seen that core PPI is coming in at 2.4% per year, and 66% of that PPI number that came in was related to energy. So it's it's really a case of what happens to energy moving forward. And I think if if energy just moderates and sticks around this level for a period of time, the portfolio performs very well. And I think that's a pretty good risk to reward play, given that the prices that we pay for the company are below average long term. For argument's sake, the market in a in a previous rate hike cycle would pay 24, 25 times for PayPal. That's 2017 into 2019. Uh, we had quantitative tightening, rate hikes, same growth compounded at 20%, which is what we're expecting moving forward. And we get to buy it at 20 times, which is below what a previous average was. So I think that we've bought really good quality assets where, of course, when the share price is dropping lower, everybody assumes that the business model has changed. And I don't think that's a fair reflection of what actually happened. So look, I think um, we have a portfolio. It's a good quality portfolio. It's a little bit of volatility. And I think on a risk return basis, I think that uh, we've we've assumed a pretty decent risk for outsized returns. And that's sort of how I view it. Okay, fantastic. Let me talk about one thing I wanted to raise with you as a concern for copying you, Rob. Mm. You strike me as a man of great energy, both mental and physical. Oof. But I want to hear that you have a good balance going on. I saw someone once ask you, what do you do to unwind from all this investing stress? And you said you get on the treadmill and run until you feel like crying. Yes, sir. Not the most reassuring <laughs> answer in my mind. To which I replied, I do the same, and it usually takes me about 30 seconds. <laughs> but on a serious note, exercise is great and all. Yeah. But I want to hear about you chilling out and really unwinding. And, you know, do you meditate? Have you tried yoga? Do you do your worries ease away when you play with your kids or with your pugs dressed in Bilbao shirts? What does Rob do to really relax? <laughs> we don't dress them in Bilbao shirts. Well, I mean, the reason why I go to exercise is so as I stress out in the in the gym as opposed to in front of the computer. I mean, stress is stress. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. Prices going down or running for too long on a treadmill. Um, yeah, I mean, yesterday, I mean, we went for went to the park with the kids, went for lunch, usual stuff, just a very plain vanilla type life. But uh, yeah, a little bit of exercise is is healthy in my view, and certainly when we went to a bear market. Rob's in peace, peak physical shape, and then we're in a bull market. Rob's a fat slob. So uh, it, that's the hard balance is being consistent with the exercise. Let's move on to Marco, my volatility guy. The ballast in my ship to help steady things when other copies are rolling this way and that in choppy seas. The guy who will make money when markets move up or down, right? Not exactly. Things have not really been going according to plan. And recently, due to your realization that the vehicle VXX is not what it used to be, you've been forced to reevaluate your approach. Now, I've read your posts on VXX. But I have to say, it's pretty difficult stuff to grasp. So in words of one syllable, that even the listener, and indeed the host, can understand, why is VXX an unreliable asset to trade nowadays? Well, uh, VXX has been changing for a while now, and that's also the reason why I had to change my approach uh, towards it. Volatility as a whole has been uh, very abnormal, uh, pretty much post uh, the, the, the COVID crash of, of 2020. In a normal 
market setup, what you get is you get volatility spikes. And after a spike has happened, you get either you get a bigger spike if something else bigger happens, or you get a slow grind downwards uh, in, in volatility. That hasn't really happened this time. So throughout, let's say, 2022 to right now, we have been in a constant period of high volatility. Not as high as it was uh, during the, the, the height of the crash, but still higher than usual. And the way that these products work is that they buy, without going into too much detail, they buy futures contracts and you kind of play on the exposure that you get in the futures contracts. You don't get the same risk to reward anymore right now that you got before the crash. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the products themselves have changed. It just means that people are positioning themselves in a, in a different way. Right now, what you're seeing is that people are hedging themselves in a very big way. And that means that these products, especially through volatility, and that means that these products are constantly, as you may say, overvalued. It's not the correct word because you cannot really say volatility is overvalued. But reflective of the history of these products, yes, they are way more expensive than they used to be. So if you buy volatility products here, you're not going to really benefit that much from uh, another increase in volatility. And that's because the futures contracts are already very high. So you get a risk on the downside, but you don't get that much profit potential on the upside. So normally these situations will correct themselves. So they will only last for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months. But right now we've been going for uh, two plus years uh, of this situation. So in the beginning of the year, I made the decision, okay, it may be that we are really in a, in a new era where people are hedging themselves much more than they, than they used to. And that means that you need to search for alternatives for, in order to make uh, profits in, in these markets. Now, on top of that, uh, VXX actually last week, the, the, the issuing uh, bank Barclays, they, they halted the share creations uh, of VXX, which now makes it actually a completely untradable product. It is now actually uh, going up and down based not, not just on volatility uh, um, expectations anymore, but just uh, buyer and seller demand. So right now it's even worse than it was before. So this is why I had to use different products and I rewrote my strategy in order to, to make sure that I was able to cope with these new changes. Now, of course, the beginning of the, of the year, just like the majority of traders, hasn't been the best. I mean, we haven't really gone through a deep drawdown uh, on, under, the, under the strategy, but yeah, it has been a uh, little bit choppy. So has your reimagined approach very much settled down now? Uh, what do you mean settled down? It struck me that you were sort of wrestling with this transition into investing in a different style. Is that is it a settled process that you're in now? It is definitely a settled process. And I'm even happy to say, I'm still tracking my old strategy uh, on paper to see how it would have performed. And I can tell you that the new strategy is outperforming the old strategy. So uh, the only exception being uh, this month where the old strategy would have outperformed as a whole from January the 1st, when I put the new strategy into effect until now. The new approach has, um, has outperformed the, the, the old strategy. Now, I know what you're going to say. You say you're going to say, uh, is it still, can it still be considered a hedging uh, strategy because you're going down when the markets are going down? But what, what most people tend to forget is that a hedging strategy is not necessarily something that works for every down day. I mean, if I were to come up with something where where the markets are doing good, I'm, I'm either doing good or, let's say, uh, breaking even. And when the markets go down, I'm making money. Well, I mean, that would be the equivalent of having a crystal ball. A hedging strategy hedges against big market drops. And I'm very sorry to say, but we haven't seen that yet. Sure, the markets are down globally uh, in some uh, parts of the world more than in other parts. But what most investors tend to forget is that we see 
drawdowns in equity markets between 15 and 20 percent once every two years on average. The last time this happened was exactly two years ago. So it's not like this is, is, is something that is uh, coming out of the blue. Uh, my strategy is still a hedging strategy, um, as you can rest assured, and it will uh, give you uh, proper protection when markets really drop. I don't consider a market drop between right now more or less 15% a significant market drop. That's just part of the markets. That is part of the, how markets work and how uh, fluctuations happen. Okay. See, I understood more from that little interchange than I did, I think, from your posts. Not that there's anything wrong with the way you wrote your posts, but as we discussed on your previous appearance, one's able to communicate sometimes in the video context much more than in the written post. So any more plans for your proposed YouTube channel that you mentioned in your first Copy Traders Club appearance? Yeah, yeah. So I actually did make a video at, at, at some point last year, and uh, I was having with, uh, literally my finger on the button to publish it, and I eventually decided not to because I showed it to some people, and they were like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is way too technical. This is way too uh, far out there. And yeah, the problem is that I love talking about volatility and about the technicals and about all that stuff, but... I have to also realize that mo most people don't really care about all the technicals. They want to know the, the bigger picture. And sadly for me, yeah, that's where my interest lies. I, I occasionally post, I understand way too technical things and uh, it, it may uh, be easier to grasp if I post a video about it. But on the other hand, it may also not be because it's, it's basically the same, just repackaged in a, in a different format. So I don't know if it really will be very helpful to, to, to people. Well, I would repeat my encouragement to you to get on with the Elite Vault YouTube videos, if only just a monthly update for copiers. That's, of course, a different thing. Eh? Like a monthly update, that is something that I can definitely do. What but I'm, that's all I mean, really. Okay, so you would mean like no technicals whatsoever, keep that for your posts and just uh, give you an update on, on the status. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we'll check back in a year's time and see how that project has moved on. As for this conversation, we will now move on to Wes. Wes, who is currently occupying the troublesome fourth PI slot in my lineup. I started copying you around Christmas when I looked down your portfolio and saw lots of stocks that I either know and like or that I don't know that well, but I'm happy to own vicariously through someone who has done the work on them. Mm -hmm. So... Generally speaking, an attractive portfolio at prices that look like a, an end of year sale. Very true. Little did I realize that the January sales were coming <laughs> and indeed the February sales and March madness discounts, but still no hindsight bias allowed. So Wes, like Robert, you've been closing some positions to free up some cash, nibbling a bit here and there. Yep. No nibbling at BABA, I notice, but nibbling at Digital Turbine. Corsair, UI Path that I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. You've opened new positions in some obscure little small caps like Google, Facebook, <laughs> Netflix, and Palantir. Yep. Whereas I'm a big fan of your video updates mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, where time and again you repeat the message that this is normal, no need to freak out, it'll all work out in the long run. Mm -hmm. but it has to be acknowledged that you're having quite a long run of misery. So how much of the tunnel remains before we are bathed in light? <laughs> um, well, again, no, no crystal ball, so I can't know for certain. And that's why as I see new, better risk-reward opportunities popping up, I might be closing out certain positions to reallocate capital. I think that there were probably uh, what was your term exactly? The the tube tube path of misery, tube of misery. <laughs> it's just that you're having quite a long run of misery. I was asking when is the light at the end of the tunnel going to reach us? Yeah, and I think I think that the I mean obviously I feel that just like copiers do, but I think that there are two two forces at play. I think early last year and in my end of year review video. 
I went into some detail about this. I think probably the first quarter last year, I made mistakes becoming a full-time investor. For the first time, I went way too broad. I saw a lot of interesting ideas and nibbled at far too many. And that had some consequences. And I had some ideas that didn't pan out. So investments in the UK and China didn't work out early last year. But I think for the last three quarters, two, maybe three quarters, depending on where you were invested, there was a bear market forming beneath the surface. So I think that the the challenging path has been two things. First of all, it, it feels longer because I made some mistakes up front. Uh, and then I was wearing the bear market after that. And that eventually became a more widespread bear market that we found in the major indices towards the end of last year, the beginning of, of this year. So I think in terms of strategy for the last few quarters, I wouldn't say that there are any things that I have done incorrectly, but there are just certain market conditions that have meant that good quality companies have dropped in value. And it feels as though, but I mean, we can't be sure. It felt before the Ukrainian and Russian war kicked off, it, found as the, it felt as though the market was beginning to find a bottom. There was a, a brief period where my portfolio popped back into the positive for the year. But then the war kicked off and, and it hit a lot of equities, even harder than, than they had been hit already. So once again, I feel like we're in the place where the market feels as though it's found a bottom. I mean, I know that I speak about fundamentals quite a lot. I talk about macro quite a lot, but also looking at the technicals of in many various places, I feel as though the bottom is there. And I was going to talk about it in a video today. So I, I, I do, even though I'm not a trader, I consider myself a long-term investor, I do still research all of the different ways of making money in the market. And quite an interesting perspective is one that traders use, which is the life cycle of the market. The, I don't know if you've heard about the four-stage model with any market, which is there's the consolidation phase, the accumulation phase, the market rises, it then tops out, it drops off into what's called a stage four decline for rebuilding bases. And I think we're seeing a lot of bases being rebuilt in indices, but also stock prices. So that base being a flattening, a sideways consolidation after a large drop in prices. Okay, and also I note your impressive hold on a steady number of copiers has recently loosened and quite a few have headed for the exit. <laughs> and something I wanted to mention is that both you and Robert are teetering on the edge of risk score seven. You both tipped seven recently. I'm seven. A listener called John Salmon asked me in the YouTube comment section of the most recent episode whether this is a concern for me on the basis that as PIs, you guys are incentivized not to be copy blocked. Or if you are, you want it lifted ASAP. Nah. Might that lead to you guys making moves in the portfolio which benefit you? but not me. Can I answer that first? Go ahead. L let me ask you a question. In three years' time, when we look back on this period, am I incentivized to bring my risk score down now and hamper my results or have a better, more attractive track re record long-term? It doesn't make any sense. It's so short-term focused to try and fix your risk score. I posted a video about the risk score earlier, like hitting seven. I have no incentive to bring my risk score down right now. There's six companies that account for 50% of my risk score. Overstock, Crocs, Facebook. They're all companies. One of the lowest risks in my portfolio is Bitcoin. It's one of the biggest positions in my portfolio. And the reason why Bitcoin is one of the lowest risks today is because the volatility, the average true range of the asset as it consolidated sideways came way down. The reason why Crocs, a company that's dirt cheap, producing fantastic cash flow and growing like wildfire is one of the highest is because over the past six months has had heightened volatility, but on the upside, on the downside, I bought it after a 38% drop this year. You know, I bought Facebook after a 20% drop. So disproportionately the risk in terms of volatility of that asset increases, but relative to what I bought, I think it's very low risk. 
So today, my risk score looks very high, but my portfolio is lower risk today versus what it was six months ago. In fact, if you look at my risk score, it was four back in August. And I think you guys would agree that since August, I had four months of a risk score of four, and it didn't positively impact my results whatsoever. The risk score is a measure of volatility and it's trailing. It's, it's lagging in nature. So, I mean, I, I see this volatility as opportunity and I'm quite happy to have a high, be copy blocked, have a high risk score now, because in the future, it's really about generating outsized returns where it makes sense. And so I, to me, if I'm copy blocked, I'm copy blocked, but I'm more a slave to the performance. Would you go along with that, Wes? Uh, so I agree that so performance is one of the most important factors in having a business on eToro. So I would say, yes, having an excellent return is the primary thing that I would want to achieve, even if it meant that I was copy blocked for a certain amount of time. However, I think in the current market conditions, I might be able to reduce my exposure to a certain asset that is contributing a very large amount of risk to my portfolio because there are just so many opportunities around. But I don't think I would drop anything. I wouldn't make huge scale changes to my portfolio. I might tweak a little bit here and there. In fact, there might be some coming coming today. Um, Mercado Libre jumped 32% over the past seven days. Somewhere around there, and I think it's still got a lot to go. Um, but if I'm going to shave half a percent off of that position, and put it somewhere else that's going to give me a decent return and that's going to bring down my risk score and keep it below the threshold then i'm okay with that Okay, part two, I think we ought to talk about what's going on in the PI feeds. The market is, or was, well down until very recently. Copiers are losing their shit, or as they would spell it, L-O-O-S-I-N-G, their shit. They're hurling abuse, screaming at eToro, closing copies in deep red, and hopping to this month's hero. So I'd like us to discuss the varying communication strategies PIs can adopt, their effectiveness, their limitations, and indeed the inherent self-interest that you have in keeping copiers copying. Well, a good place to start would be, what do you think is the least advisable PI approach to dealing with irate copier comments, Wes? I would say you probably don't want to hurl abuse back at them. Um, I I have seen people, not for a while now, but I have seen people historically lose it a little bit. There's a lot of pressure as a popular investor when you're receiving a constant stream of negativity. And obviously the people on eToro, like in the rest of the world, are they have various backgrounds ages, levels of maturity, etc. So you you can get some fairly aggressive people on there. But I think that the the number one thing to do is if anything is affecting the way you feel and the potential for your response is to step away, calm yourself down and, you know, give a bit more of a, a measured response because escalating it is not going to work out for anyone. Yes, and you do sometimes see that, like PIs trying to give as good as they get. And I definitely don't think that's a winning strategy. Not on eToro and, and not in life, really. I think you need to be sort of uh, empathetic towards the copier as well. I mean, it's a hard-earned money, but I think part of it's got to do with obviously better communicating, understanding where we currently are. I haven't had any, like my copiers are silent, like very strangely silent. I don't hear very much from them at all. And so I, I, I can't really... I haven't had a situation like that yet, but I think a lot of it's got to do with, for argument's sake, the, in a, the Q3 quarterly call last year, I'd mentioned that we expect volatility to increase, and that's exactly what happened. And in January, when opportunities presented themselves, it suggested that we close out positions and rotate. There might be a little bit more active management going on, and that's exactly what we've done. And I, I don't think, 
like I've always tried to be in there about a week or two before something happened and explain exactly what expectations were and, and how I would move about it. And I think for the most part, a lot of people kind of understood that. So I haven't had that kind of negative backlash yet, but I'm only on platform two years. But um, I guess if I was to role play, I, I think you got to be empathetic and you got to understand their situation as well. And I think the most important thing for me to do is try and encourage people before they copy the portfolio to understand that certainly my philosophy is you make lots of money over 10, 20 years, not over three, six months. And I think if people have the same frame of mind, the near term doesn't really matter. I mean, you could average 20, 30% compounded over a long period of time, for argument's sake, Warren Buffett, 20% for 60 years. He didn't get 20% every single year. And I think it's unrealistic to assume that that's possible, but you might on certain years massively outperform and in other years can be a little bit of a drag and that's perfectly normal. But over a long period of time, I mean, Wesley, in the last year or so, you've gone through a little bit of turbulent water, but you're still at 30% compounded over a six, seven year period. And so it's normal that you go through these drags and I think what's most important really is to kind of share that philosophy and that sort of expectation with copiers. It's, it's sort of like a long game. But anyway, again, I'm not a, like I can't speak from experience, but um, I guess I'm kind of lucky as well. Rob, you just mentioned copiers joining with a clear understanding of what they're going to get from the PI, what the investing strategy is. That makes me think of Karan's copier spike after GameStop, where people saw that and they all dashed to him and he, he, he rocketed to a thousand copiers. And that has halved and a little bit more since then, as copiers have come to realize what kind of investor Karan is. So you had to deal with a lot of that, Karan. Tell us about your experiences. Yeah, I mean, there was a huge spike right after, I think in Feb. And um, it's it's just been down since then. And probably this month, I might actually lose the elite uh, status just because the AUM has dropped. But uh, does it phase me? Not not so much because, again, like the goal has never really been about maximizing AUM or maximizing the copiers. It's been about returns, and I think that will come over time. And one thing that I, I personally like that Wes does is that he has that weekly update. So I admit that, you know, I've been kind of quiet, especially during the volatile times, but I think starting to incorporate something like that would be, would be good. So at least people know how I'm thinking about the portfolio, about the market on a week to week basis. I'm not sure that is as good for my own psychology because I feel like you actually make better returns when you're not looking at the market as much, but I can understand the psychology of the investors and, you know, I can empathize with that. Well, I think something that's almost as bad as fighting fire with fire when it comes to copier anger is leaving their questions unanswered completely and staying away, even when there's this sea of questions. Uh, Marco, have you had much experience of people complaining on your feed about your strategy and results? Uh, complaining about my strategy results? No. Uh, it's, it's like Robert Robert's uh, experience. I haven't really gotten any yeah, heated discussions. There was uh, one person last year who was, let's say, a little bit aggressively in his tone and in his comments, but that was not because of my strategy. That was because of a technical issue where his uh, his copy of me was not copying every position and he was returning a little bit the anger on me but it's like yeah i understand that that's a problem and that needs to be fixed but there's little i can do i can escalate it to eToro, but beyond that it's, it's out of my control so um besides that no i'm, I'm also uh very glad that my my uh, all my discussions and all the questions that I've received, all the comments that I've received have been generally uh, positive in tone. I saw a post, Wes, on your feed just recently, just the other day, which is kind of, it basically proves all of what we're saying. It reassured copiers who clearly need a lot of reassurance. It turned the heat level down from some commentators who might otherwise have been venting. And their comments therefore go from 
ranting and raving into genuine questions. And you also addressed the concerns of N. Jones, 82, who wanted to know about your high returns from earlier years and whether he could expect those into the future. I'm sure you remember on your first Copy Traders Club appearance, I challenged your continued reference in your bio to lifetime returns as something of a potentially morally dubious marketing hook. But I see that you have changed your bio a little bit and you've you're now expressing it as total and annualized returns over the past five years, which excludes the leverage and crypto days of yore. So that too is pleasing. Yeah. It's nice to make a difference. So top marks to Wesley for that. So the, the, the counter argument I would have there is that that strategy earned some good results, but it also earned some pretty negative results. So... I'm still not sure where I stand in, in completely cutting out historical returns. But yeah, so I, I would say that my approach for many years now has been the same without leverage. Um, but yeah, so I, th- I, I don't think I try to hide. I have a lot of people asking me a lot of questions every day. And if I try to answer them, all of them, to the level of quality that, that everyone would want, I would spend a lot of time just doing that. Sure. So what I tend to try to do is to collate questions and I have FAQs and whatever else that I that I share to try and help answer that and then dip in once in a while just to make sure that I am talking to people. And I think the post that I put out was a result of uh I, I had thought that my weekly videos were giving people a pretty good view of my thoughts on the state of the market. Uh but my videos are maybe a little too uh, abstracted from the portfolio. So yeah, I saw you commenting on the the long thread of of hate <laughs> that was that prompted that that follow up post. Not contributing to it, I hasn't to. Yeah. <laughs> Wes, what did you mean that your views were abstracted from the portfolio? So as a long term investor, I would say that doing a weekly review of my portfolio doesn't make sense. It also kind of missets expectations because I'm a long-term investor. I, I shouldn't be looking at my performance weekly. I should buy my good companies and let them have their run. So my weekly video is, is an update of what I think is going on in the world. And I don't trade around macro, but it's good to understand the context. And then maybe some segues into approaches that I think mirror mine uh, in terms of investment. So, for example, in my last video, I took the long-term view of Google, right? So, again, there's some hindsight bias there because Google's done very well over 20 years. But that's the kind of asset that I'm looking for. I'm looking for assets that, that have a good performance over two decades. And I was using that as an example of there might be drawdowns along the way and some of those and sale raise consolidations that last for a year or longer. And I expect this to be the case with some of my assets. But I think that I didn't maybe refer specifically enough to my portfolio and linking that to Google as an example. And so people were angry because they were saying that, where is the portfolio review? Why aren't you talking about the state of the portfolio? And so after that, I created something a lot more specific. And I put that out. And as Gavin has said, that was quite well received. It seems to answer a lot of questions and concerns in under 5,000 characters. Just on historical performance, yeah, it's true that you can't predict where the future performance is like to be, but it's your resume during different market environments. And if I was to ask you a question, if Warren Buffett was to live another 60 years, what's the over-under that he compounds at 20%, given that he's compounded 20% for the previous 60 years through periods where growth performed very well in the 90s, value in the 2000s, growth in the 2010s, different type of market environments he's performed very well consistently for 60 years. And over those 60 years, he's had three periods where Berkshire Hathaway dropped greater than 50%. And so <clears throat> to look in the past and say compounding a 20% year on year for 60 years is not likely to continue into the future is a little bit, in my, in my view, it's a little bit unfair. Sure, the longer the track record, the more consistent it's likely to be. But Warren Buffett hasn't changed the strategy for 60 odd years. The type of business has changed and more recently bought into, for argument's sake, Apple 
which is very different from what he would previously invest in, but his type of investing is still exactly the same. Okay, but I would just reply to that by saying that N. Jones, 82, asked very specifically as to whether in copying ways he could expect the returns from six or seven years ago into the future or had anything changed, as you say. But I mean, that's and, a very misleading question, very well, mi- because it's impossible to know. I know he doesn't expect know. them, but the point is, you said Warren Buffett hasn't changed, whereas Wes, Wes was saying things have changed. I won't be doing the same things as I did back then. Yes, yeah, so the strategy is improving, so you should expect more consistent and better returns because he's learned. More more time in the market, the, the more lessons you learn. I think it's very like, – people ask me all the time, what do you expect to make from this company? I haven't got a clue, but I know that I'm underpaying relative to historical context, and I know the, the high probable degree of cash flow stream that's going to come from it. And so, like, to say that historical performance doesn't matter, I mean, I, I think it's incredibly unfair. Well, I don't wish to be incredibly unfair, of course, but I would again just say he wasn't asking maybe for expected returns, but but the expected investing approach. And Wes was keen to Wes was keen to clarify that that approach is not what he can expect going forward. He can expect mm-hmm. the more recent approach okay. over the five years okay, that he now holds. So we're all friends. We're all still friends. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But I hear that all the time. It's like you know, when Warren Buffett started out on year one, he couldn't imagine that he was going to have this track record 60 years later. And if he had any sort of aura of confidence in that moment, everyone would say he's crazy. After 10 years, people would say, you're not in the market long enough. After 20 years, you're still not in the market long enough. After 30 years, okay, maybe. You know, people are very sort of cynical, very cynical. And I think that's also a problem as well. But anyway, that's just my view. His approach also would have changed through those decades, right? I mean, he was buying different sized companies, different types of companies at that time. Well, he went from cigar butts to, you know, like it has evolved over time, absolutely. And I mean, like that's investing as a process of elimination. Make a mistake, make sure you don't make it again. And so it's impossible to say like yesterday is going to be the same as tomorrow, but to some degree you can stay on the right path, I think. I think some things change, some things don't, because it's not everything that has changed from his approach. Because if you look at him during the Buffett partnerships, he was still quite concentrated. If you look at him today, you still see Apple being a huge chunk of Berkshire's portfolio. So Wes says he's changed, but it's not like he's forgotten everything that he's done, right? So it just adds on to the approach. Yeah. Of course, yeah. It's building on, it's getting better. Pretty much what Rob mentioned. It's easy to lump on when somebody's having a period, a soft period, you know, and I just don't think that's very fair. I, you know, Wes is lucky that he has like six, seven years of uh, performance. I, I, like I'm two years and I'm trying to convince people that this is the right, it's a lot harder. I'm sure I'll go through a soft patch as well, you know. Well, I've put my money where my mouth is and I copy Wes, so I'm behind it. Yeah. I'm behind all you guys. I just want what's best for all of you. Well, thank you very much, Gav. I really appreciate that. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club. Okay, so part three of today's discussion, we're going to talk about financial YouTube. So we have four PIs. I would categorize you as follows, but please feel free to correct me. Marco doesn't make YouTube videos, despite earlier assurances on this podcast. Wesley makes frequent YouTube videos, essentially for his eToro copiers and would-be copiers. Karan makes infrequent videos, often for his eToro copiers, would-be copiers. For example, monthly updates, but also some other subjects. And Robert, who makes frequent YouTube videos for both his eToro copiers and would-be copiers, but also other subjects and is really the most easily definable of the four as a financial YouTuber. Is that fair to say? Well, that's sort of what the bracket I've fallen into, sure. So there are a lot of financial YouTubers out there and some, particularly the most popular, can be pretty horrific in my view. Some of them are so big that they can use their audience as the suckers in a pump and dump. There are plenty who receive payments to make videos about certain products, 
sponsored content. There are a lot whose motivation seems to be to sell courses, many of which I imagine are pretty worthless, or to generate cash from affiliate links. These are less egregious practices, I suppose, but I still doubt their motivation for creating the content, and sometimes, therefore, the content itself. Others, on the other hand, are an amazing source of insight, particularly into specific stocks, personal finance, the psychology of investing, and so on. So it can be an incredible resource for gathering information. So I suppose the first issue is quality control. How do we start with that topic? Quality control. Um, well, let, let me just, I just want to go over like me as a financial YouTuber. I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of kind of unwinding that sort of process and getting away from YouTube. Uh, what I've realized over the past six months is that, you know, you listen to Munger and Buffett all the time saying that the market is used as a sort of mechanism for gambling. And I used to think that was tongue in cheek. Like sometimes they say stuff that's just to get a little bit of attention. But I'm almost convinced 95% at least are, are just gambling in the market. And more recently, I, I took a break for the past month for posting videos. I do everything sort of unlisted and I only post it to, to eToro now to be more specific. But um, more recently, for argument's sake, I had a copier that copied my portfolio, eToro. Uh, encourages us to write a post uh, about specific companies, why we own it. And so I done a, a post about Foot Locker and I invested in Foot Locker and explained why I was investing in Foot Locker. And I decided that after a 38% drop, just as just a, a quick example, um, Crocs was a better opportunity. So rather than hold through the earnings, which is a binary outcome, I decided to close the day before earnings for Foot Locker. And I invested the money in Crocs, thought that the valuation, the opportunity was better. Foot Locker's earnings came out, and obviously I didn't anticipate a you know, 20 30% drop, and that's what happened. And I had a copier reach out to me and say, well, I'm copying you, but I decided to go and invest in Foot Locker as well, and you should have told me that you sold it. And I, like, I don't want to bash on anyone specifically, but that was really where, to me, it was like you're investing in a portfolio for somebody to manage the risk and diversify and protect capital while uh, hopefully outperforming uh, on the upside yet taking individual companies to try and outperform without fully understanding why they own it or how to manage that risk. And that's something that I've come across over the past six to 12 months consistently on YouTube, always getting these comments. Like I, I kind of just like talking about companies, businesses, that type of stuff. And I just enjoyed posting those type of, that type of content, but only stuff that I would buy. And I can see that from the, the person watching, not everyone, like it's, it's, it's not everyone, by the way. But I can see this sort of really, really, really bad sort of habit of really using the market as gambling, gambling, a mechanism for gambling. And that kind of made me take a step back and reassess whether I wanted to do it or whether I didn't. And to be honest, I want to go back to the way I was previously, where I could focus on investing, generate outsized returns and kind of get the fun of investing back. So on, on, on YouTube, if I go back to the earlier days, I used to, because I'm very competitive, I used to create content based on what the comments suggested. You get down this route of only producing content because a, a large group of people, even if you hate the companies, like I didn't like mm -hmm. any of the EV companies early in 2021 when I stopped commenting about it. And um, you end up going down this sort of pathway where you're not speaking in the best behalf of the, uh, the viewer or the listener by just concentrating on what's most popular for views. And so it makes it very difficult. And so my, for me anyway, I feel like YouTube can be very dangerous in that matter because you can be incentivized, people offering you money. I've been offered tens of thousands of dollars to do analysis on these penny gold stocks, junior miners, which is clearly a scam. It's just to raise capital. And so you got to differentiate like uh, all of this that's going on. And for me anyway, I feel like, like I don't know what the best uh, practices are, but I can see everything that's going on and it's not something that I like. So when you say a finance YouTuber, um, I, I'd like to believe that uh, I'm more of an investor than uh, a YouTuber. So I'm trying to work my way off that. Okay, very interesting. Anyone else's thoughts on that? The internet is a, a mean place. <laughs> so th there are, there's a lot of negativity in it. And I think that you do, <clears throat> you see a lot of positive people posting now again and encouraging things, but for some reason, the squeakiest wheels tend to also be the meanest um 
But in terms of the quality of of YouTubers out there, I suspect we're going to see a cycle the same that you see in any kind of industry. So there's been an enormous rise in the number of retail investors, which has created this fantastic opportunity for charlatans. And the charlatans have come out in huge numbers. But over time, I I think that as the market has gone through this huge amount of volatility, it's shaken out some of those retail investors and the opportunity available, first of all, isn't as big anymore. But second of all, more people have gone through the experience. And I think they might be more wary of the charlatans, which will create a smaller audience for them too. I'm kind of, I'm sanguine, I'm, I'm optimistic in general. So this is what I hope, but it's also combined with my experience in other types of businesses outside of the YouTube, financial YouTuber model. Well, one thing I like to talk about is I imagine eToro growing hugely in the years ahead and therefore pressure being put on these financial YouTubers who don't have a public profile and aren't making money for their copiers. They're trying to make money off their viewers. They're leveraging their audience in every way they can. I mean, wouldn't that be a wonderful antidote to many of the ills of the financial YouTube world? Gav, just just on that point there, I mean, if you look at the engagement on Intaro, it's extremely low. Like the way in which you can write posts, it's, it's not like you can go to, I don't know, like medium.com and stuff like that. And you can write a big, good quality post and insert images and all that type of stuff and make it like very specific. You can't do that on Intaro. So the posts are very bland. You get a little bit of font changes. What I'm trying to say is if the engagement was better because there was better quality posts. The platform, the social media platform was better. I think that eToro should differentiate a social media platform and improve the quality of actually posting and engagement on that platform from the trading business. And if they could do that, I think you end up dragging an awful lot of people off YouTube yeah. onto eToro where it's more specific. And that way they can moderate all of these scams and get rid of an awful lot of them. And it can be very, very much more specific. But you know, I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for eToro as well is how do you moderate? Like if you had somebody that had a client that has a million dollars in their account and they decide to be very difficult in on, on the social media aspect of things, how do you kick that person out if they're a, a very valuable client? And so in my view, I think of the engagement on the platform on eToro for posting, because I think it's dead right now. I've got 1.9 million people following me. I might get 50 likes on a post and I might get like 100 people that actually read it. Like there's not a lot of engagement at all. If they could improve that, um, I think you actually have an awful lot more people coming to eToro to post this stuff as opposed to going to YouTube to post it to a broader community. But um, yeah, it becomes very difficult then. It's it's an extremely difficult job then to try and moderate a community at the same time, monetize community through trading fees. It's It's very difficult. And so... I don't know. I think that that's, that's an area that could be improved massively, but it's a really difficult challenge. I just wanted to ask how you feel about the, like, is it, is it just me that feels like the, the stream is very difficult to get across a specific point? In eToro? I mean, there's 5,000 5, 5, letters as a cap. I mean, when you're trying to get across a thesis, it's not like Twitter where you're trying to get a, a bullet point across. It's like, it's a full thesis. It, should, it shouldn't be capped in my view. Then you're going into the comment section, and then the flow of the of the it, the flow of the sort of analysis is either condensed or it's kind of broken because you you ended up using either two posts or the comment section. I just think there's certain things that like because of the nature of the content that you're posting, uh, I think you should be able to throw in graphs, charts, all that s- sort of stuff to show exactly where we're at. I mean, like there's websites, website builders, Teachable, that type of stuff, Squarespace. They all give you different sections where you can just drag and drop. I, I, I don't think it's something that could be very difficult in order for them to improve. And I think if the engagement increases, you end up with something very similar to Seeking Alpha in the sense where you can generate good quality analysis. I don't know what Seeking Alpha is like. I'm just using that as an example. I know there's a lot of engagement over there, but eToro could easily replicate something like that. And I think if you improve the delivery of that analysis, people will start to come over and, and use it and the engagement increases a lot more. But I think a, ch- a challenge for eToro is the breadth of the audience that exists on the platform. There 
my guess is that a lot of people don't want to read 5,000 character posts. They want someone to tell them Bitcoin is going to go up 20% tomorrow. You should buy it now. They want two, two, two sentences. But there are, there are also those people that want to read 5,000 characters. And those are the extremes, right? So there's all the people in between. How do you allow people to create content that's relevant to all the various different types of audiences that are already there? Just on that point, though, uh, Wes, right? So who do you think has the capacity to build out a bigger account? Somebody that wants to hop between assets every week to week or somebody that's more sophisticated is going to re- read a 5,000-word sort of essay on, on why a company is good quality. Somebody that's going to invest time into understanding the analysis probably has higher education, better income, probably going to invest an awful lot more and probably as, a, as a, an individual on the platform is going to, going to generate far more revenue for eToro anyway. Yeah. Then somebody is going to gamble away fifty or, or 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 seventy bucks or whatever it may be on Bitcoin over two weeks. That's twenty times leverage. And so, I I think if you encourage the right uh, practices, uh, you may not have like millions and millions and millions of people, but you probably will have more AUM. And I think if they started transitioning it, like you look at it right now with an awful lot of the PIs coming on board, a lot of them are. Now I'm seeing so much more investment managers, emerging investment managers, because it's it's so difficult to set up a limited partnership. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to get $10 million in assets under management, you collect 1% fee, because that's the going rate, so $100,000 in revenue, and then you get a percentage of the gain on the upside, right? The $100,000, then you have to pay your legal costs, your accounting costs, and there's nothing left over. ETAR will give you an awful lot better of a... Um, a uh, package if you can get to 10 million versus setting up your own limited partnership. And so I'm seeing an awful lot of people that were in limited partnerships that have trans- transferred over to Taro. And if you transfer that sort of mentality from focusing on short-term gains, over trading, gambling, essentially to more sophisticated trading, more capital is going to follow with it. I'd prefer to have a hundred copiers and grow wealth with them over the next you know, 10, 20 years rather than have 10,000 that are really only using it as an ATM machine over the next three months to try and make an extra 10%. I agree with you. And I mean, I think our approaches in, in that respect are similar. But the average amount invested on eToro, I think they published a paper before they were, they were going to do the SPAC. And I think the average amount was about $900, $1,000. But I also know that there are people on the platform with millions of dollars. so. I think that they make money in both buckets. I think that they're they want to attract the big the, the people that have lots of capital, but also they don't mind having a million people that have five hundred five hundred dollars in there, and you know the personalities of those people and sophistication with regards to investment are usually quite different. Okay, so that's a really good point, and and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having nine hundred dollars. Zero wrong with having nine hundred dollars. Those that have nine hundred dollars that buy into a longer term philosophy and in investing more cautiously or more committed to it. They'll probably add $100, $200 every single month. And if you compound that even at just 10%, 10 years from now, it's not $900. It's probably tens of thousands of dollars. And so like what I'm trying to say is if you more incentivize good practices, capital will grow in tandem. Because for eToro, I mean, you can have a million people that have $1,000, right? So you have a billion dollars in AUM, or you could have you know 10,000 people that have a million dollars. You know, it's the same outcome. I just think it's more sustainable, uh, longer term. It makes an awful lot more sense. It gets a lot rid of a, an awful lot of the the riffraff scams. I don't. I, I think an awful lot of people, if they're willing to learn, will be able to catch on to the, a lot of these sort of scams that go on online an awful lot more because they'll do a little bit more diligent work. And those that really want to gain in, in insights and knowledge, that's just my view, guys. I mean, I, I don't have the answers. Okay, let's bring it back to YouTube a bit more if we can. We've strayed a little bit from the path. Have any of you looked into the legal aspect of your disclaimers where you say that this isn't financial advice? Has anyone actually consulted a lawyer on it or obtained specific advice for yourselves? Or are you simply regurgitating what you see elsewhere? Karan's friend has uh, done a video recently now. One of your friends is a lawyer. I think I've seen it. Jack Tuffley. Yeah, Jack did a video with uh, Dane Beagle. I forgot his name. Yeah, it's pretty much a gray area. There's a lot of loopholes, and it depends on the different asset classes that you're talking about. So as as part of the certification that Robert did and that I have done, and uh, I don't know if if the other 
two guys in the call have done the, the certification, the CISI, Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments. Yeah. So as part of that, you the course is an FCA uh, regulated course, or I think it's regulated by uh, whichever local body exists within a particular geography. But you learn about these particular aspects of investment to communicate and advice or not advice in this case and the disclaimers. And in general, social media is still an area that's been worked on and they haven't locked down all of the legislation. It's a gray area in some respects, which could work in your favor or against your favor. But if if the authorities think that you were participating in market manipulation through whatever you were doing, and you were doing it knowingly, and you had the audience to do so without some kind of a disclaimer, then you'd be in trouble. And that's that's as much as I know on that specific part of the topic. On eToro, I had a a lawyer who was a bit of a troll for a while on my all of my posts saying, uh, I'm going to take all of these as advice unless you put in a disclaimer. So I was like, okay, fine. I will put in a disclaimer in that case, although I'm pretty sure that when you sign up to eToro, probably within the confines of their platform, they've got the whole thing locked down in terms of a disclaimer, uh, but it doesn't hurt. They do have, yeah, they do have it. And an awful lot of platforms have that when you sign up, it's in their terms and conditions. Um, it's really difficult as well. Like if I post a video and put it on the internet, I have no idea who's going to watch it first and foremost. So how can you constitute advice to somebody else if I said, hey, I'm going to go out and buy this company for X reason? Like, like that, I'm not saying that it's right or whether it's wrong. There's an awful lot of nefarious activity that goes on online. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is like, it really is a gray area topic. And I like, again, I'm, I'm not smart enough to know what the answers are. But how do you like if I was to say, yeah, I don't know, like, I just like to talking about specific companies that I invested in. Of course, I had the disclaimers and all that sort of stuff there, because that's what everyone else has. I mean, I mean, I'm not a, a lawyer or anything like that. So I don't know. That's one thing I was thinking about. They talk about it often in the States as maybe that's one of the stumbling blocks for eToro and copy trading in the States is that it will constitute financial advice. Well, my understanding of uh, being a copy trader or be a PI in the US, you need your Series 65. Say again? You, you need a, the, the Series 65, uh-huh. which is the their equivalent of a license that to, to give advice, essentially. You would need to do that. It's very similar to the CISI exam, except more akin to their local laws and whatnot. Um, that was my understanding. I looked into a bit. I have a lot of people that ask me from the United States, when's it come to the US? I really don't know. So I looked into it. And for everyone that I spoke to, um, I do believe that it's, it's going to be a slightly different experience, but it, you would likely need your Series 65, which is uh, a regulated qualification, essentially. And will stocks be part of what can be copied i don't know and it's funny because a lot of crypto are not qualified as uh securities um certain ones aren't they're, they're starting to change that and they're starting to define what different assets are so that's why i would imagine that cryptocurrencies are currently uh allowed in the united states but i would imagine so i mean i mean if i had a series 65 i think i might need a series 7 or something like that as well there's a number of different licenses you'd need in the u.s um, but if I had those, I could set up a, a limited partnership and I could get uh, limited partners to invest in my fund essentially. So eToro is just pretty much taken on the back end, the execution and the compliance and all that sort of stuff. So I, I can't imagine why, like, I don't want to speak on behalf of eToro either, but it makes sense to me. One thing I was thinking was if, if ever I was a PI and I had a YouTube channel, it's a sensible way of approaching it not to only make videos after the event, after you've invested, and then you're explaining, you're making the video to explain to your copiers why you have done what you have done, then the argument can't be made that you are inducing people to take actions themselves. Gav, every video I've done on a company has gone down 20% after the video. So I think it's probably better that I'm delayed anyway. <laughs> it's hard to know when a bottom or a top is. Well, sometimes I used to record videos and I would leave them sit for like two, three days before I got around to editing it. So sometimes it's just like time constraint. 
But from a legal point of view, saying this video is for my copiers and I'm just explaining to you what I have done in the past to you because you, sh you deserve to know that. Yeah, I think because it's a public portfolio, like people are interested if you buy into a position, what's your rationale? Copiers, I guess, want to find out what are you thinking when buying into that position. So I think doing it after the fact kind of might not resonate with copiers as much. It goes back to the challenge as well, though, as well, Gav. If, like I posted before I invested in Foot Locker, and then I decided to take that position. Like when I was faced with the opportunity between Foot Locker and Crocs, I felt like, why would I keep Foot Locker when Crocs is now at a much more attractive valuation? I swapped it over. I don't know who's going to copy me into that anyway, even if I said, hey, listen, this is for the benefit or whatever. I don't know. Like I still think there's going to be a rational behavior no matter what, what, what you say. I mean, people's behavior is not going to change based on what we say. That's the challenge that I see. People want someone to make some of these decisions for them. They want to take someone else to do, take the perceived hard work off the table and just present them with the result. So I think that is a good idea, Gav. And also one of the least gray areas that I know about in terms of social media and expressing what could be considered advice is that you need to disclose what you own. Hmm. So that's one of the, the firmer points which I take care to mention just about anywhere. And in, in that case, presenting it that way, you're doing exactly that, right? You're talking about what you've bought and why you've bought it, and at the same time disclosing your position, um, which in terms of the UK law at least is enough to show that you, you're not trying to manipulate the market. Mm. It's presenting yourself as you're learning like out in the open. That's pretty much what, if you present it that way with that intent, I think it should be fine. Uh, yeah, I think there was a specific... Uh law or rule or something like that in the US anyway that um, your friend had, uh, had pointed out that suggests that if it's somewhat in the form of education, there was a specific loophole where it could be qualified as education. Education, entertainment. Yeah, and entertainment. Uh, not necessarily that you're saying it, but the way in which you structure the, the content, um, there was a, a kind of loophole for that. Well, I think there could be no doubt that Copy Traders Club is both educational and entertaining and we're going to have to leave it there so that just about wraps it up for today's totally taro episode i'm sure the listener will enthusiastically join me in offering thanks to our guests today thanks karan thank you evan thank you rob cheers gav marco thanks gavin for having me and indeed wes it's been great thank you and thanks to you, listener, for lending me your ears. Some very interesting topics covered there, I hope you agree. And great to touch base with those four popular investors. I'd like to do more multi-guest chats, but as I'm sure you appreciate, it takes a lot of time and effort. If that's something you would like too, well... I'm sure you know how you can help make that happen. Link is in the show notes. That's all from me. See you on Discord and Facebook. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously, anything here in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just generic chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth. <laughs>